All right, welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight to hear Catherine Eden, co-author of $2 a Day. My name is Steph Schmidt. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the One Town, One Book Committee and also the We the People Committee, both of which are sponsoring this event tonight. Um, of course, we also want to thank Phillips Exeter Academy for inviting Catherine Eden to speak on campus. Um, so our, our One Town, One Book program is in its third year. This year, of course, we read $2 a day. We had some really fascinating discussions around town about the issue of poverty and the social safety net. Um, reading this book for me was a real gut punch. I, I know it was for a lot of you, too. It's compelling. It's heartbreaking. It's eye-opening. Ultimately, I found it at the end that it was even able to be hopeful. Um, so we really want to thank everyone who participated in One Town, One Book in any way, whether that was reading the book, buying the book, borrowing it from the library, joining in on any of our small group discussions, or talking to a friend about the issues in the book. And we also encourage you to spread the word about One Town, One Book so that we can get even more voices involved um, next time around. I also want to say that um, We the People, it's a lecture film series, has a great lineup of events over the next few months. If you're not on the email list, um, there's a sign-up sheet that should be circulating, and that's the best way to find out about um, our upcoming events. And um, now I'd like to introduce Catherine Eden. She's one of the nation's leading poverty researchers working in the fields of welfare and low-wage work, family life, and neighborhood contexts through direct, in-depth observations of the lives of low-income populations. Um, she's a qualitative and mixed-method researcher. She has taken on key mysteries about the urban poor that have not been fully answered by quantitative work. The hallmark of her research is her direct, in-depth observations of the lives of low-income women, men, and children. She's authored eight books and some 60 journal articles. Uh, $2 a day, which she co-authored with Luke Schaefer, was met with critical acclaim. It was included in the New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2015 and was cited as essential reporting about the rise in destitute families. Um, she's previously taught at Rutgers, Northwestern, the University of Pennsylvania, Harvard, and Johns Hopkins, and now teaches at Princeton. So please join me in welcoming Katherine Eden. So I have to say that the uh, proprietors of your local bookstore are incredibly persuasive. Uh, you know, I'm a Midwesterner. I'm from northern Minnesota, so I was not daunted by the idea of coming to New Hampshire in January. Um, but I'm super glad to be here with you tonight uh, to share a what was a remarkable journey for me, and I'm so glad that uh, it has been part of your journey this year as well. I talked to the young people at Exeter this morning. I've never talked to high school students. I've given over 150 public presentations on this book over the last uh, year and a half, and uh, it was really special. Uh, and uh, prior to giving the talk, a uh, representative from the student newspaper, Samantha Weil, called me and did an interview. She was very good. And she uh, asked all of these questions about my biography. And oftentimes people want to know about the book, but they want to know about me as well. So I ended up sharing a little bit about my biography and how it intersected with $2 a day. And, and uh, we're not going to go through all of that tonight, um, but it was really fun talking with them about how, as a person their age, I actually found my passion uh, for this kind of work and then discovered a mission, a way of actually earning a living doing the kind of storytelling and intensive listening that I've spent my career doing. But tonight, I want to talk about the two latter themes I discussed with the student uh, that I think will be broadly relevant to all of us in this audience. Uh, discovering your message, what is it that you are to tell? What is the story that you are to tell? And second, finding your voice. How is it that you are to tell uh, the story that you've been given? So every uh, book has an origin story. And uh, the origin story for $2 a day is that uh, in 2010, uh, Tim and I, my husband's right over here, were teaching at Harvard. We were in like year six teaching at Harvard. Uh, and uh, I was leading a program that had, uh, uh, had 27 of the top academics come and lecture every year. 
Um, so, you know, it's very fancy. And uh, I uh, ended up, we ended up going to Baltimore to follow up on a group of kids we'd been studying. Uh, we'd been following them and their parents since the mid-1990s. Now, all these kids had uh, been born in Baltimore public housing. So have any of you seen The Wire? Okay, this is where these kids were literally born. In fact, a couple of them were extras on the show, right? So some of the most disadvantaged environments in America. And we've been following the parents and the children along many, many years through surveys and interviews. And we'd gotten funding to come back to Baltimore to see how the young people were doing as they transitioned to adulthood. Turned out that in the scholarship about the transition to adulthood, nobody had ever talked to people, kids like, like these kids. You know, what was it like for them? So uh, we came to Baltimore, and uh, Tim was working on another book that we subsequently published together, and I was out uh, talking to these young people. Uh, and I, I remember saying to Tim, I'm learning more from these kids than I learned from all 27 seminars last year at Harvard. This is amazing. <laughs> so I felt like my head was exploding with, with the magic of their lives and, and the depth of their pain and the strength of their resilience. Uh, but along, uh, along the way and during that summer, I ended up uh, approaching the home of Ashley. Now, Ashley had been in our study all along, but we hadn't talked to her for many years um, we knew she was 19, we knew she had had a baby, and we knew she lived in the Latrobe homes. This is one of the truly degraded public housing spaces we have in Baltimore, literally tucked in the shadow of the Baltimore prison. So uh, I remember walking up to her house, knocking on the door. You know, what would we find? We didn't know. And uh, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time. I began uh, doing this work when I was in my early 20s, actually. So after a while, you get a sort of instinct. Uh, you know, some, some alarm goes off in your head when, when something's wrong. And uh, she met us at the door. And uh, the first thing I noticed is she's not making eye contact with me. She's, she's looking down. She's holding the baby right here. She's visibly unkempt. And then I noticed something that really worries me. As she's passing the baby from shoulder to shoulder, she isn't doing one critical thing. Right. The hand isn't going to the back of the head to support the neck. So we walk up the stairs. Uh, this is sort of a, a townhouse, and she, this apartment is on the second floor. And oftentimes, people in public housing, and I've known this since my early 20s when I started hanging out at Cabrini Green in Chicago, much to my parents' chagrin, uh, is that because public housing is often so degraded on the outside and the neighborhoods are so, diff uh, so dangerous, you know, you can't really use the public space, people really take a lot of pride in elaborating their private space. Uh, so in the old days when I would go into public housing in Cabrini Green, I couldn't believe the worlds people had sort of created in these apartments. There might be a bullet hole through the uh, plate glass window. It might be boarded up with plywood. But, you know, everybody had a finger hut catalog. And there were little borders and, and curtains and pictures of the kids and, and report cards, right, special mementos. Um, uh, even if someone had virtually nothing, you could always find something to brighten up the place uh, from the local goodwill. This apartment wasn't like this. There was absolutely nothing in it. Uh, the windows, by the way, were, were covered by um, sort of filthy uh, blackened dishcloths. Later I learned Ashley was afraid someone would see through the window that her brother, who uh, was a known delinquent, uh, was visiting, would shoot through the window. So there's very little light in the place. Uh, but there was nothing, no mementos, no artwork, uh, no furniture except for a trash pick couch. Um, there was a, um, a filthy uh, single bed on the floor with a torn Bugs Bunny fitted sheet. I have no idea how I remember that, but I could just see it like it was yesterday. And there was a, a table, but it was missing a leg. So it was shoved 
uh, uselessly against uh, the wall, and uh, there was just a single chair. So I uh, sat on the floor, and Ashley sat in the chair, and uh, I began asking her questions about the transition to adulthood. However, early in my career, I, my graduate advisor, who was a graduate of, uh, of Exeter, actually, um, convinced me to spend my 20s touring the country, talking to low-income single mothers about how they made ends meet. This was prior to welfare reform. So I would literally spent my 20s conducting hundreds of interviews with low-income single mothers about how they survived the very low welfare benefits that they were receiving at the time. And, you know, after you've asked people, how do you make ends meet for 10 years, it kind of gets into your, under your skin, into your brain. And so if you would go out to dinner with me, I might be tempted to say, so how, how do you make ends meet? I usually try in polite society to resist that, that impulse, but I finally asked Ashley, you know, what's going on here? There's nothing in the house. And as I was sitting on the floor, by the way, I had a perfect uh, view into the kitchen. And in this particular unit, the, the doors of the cabinets had been removed. And, and the, there was nothing in there. There was nothing in the cabinets. And so I found out uh, that not only was there no uh, income from a job coming into this household, there were three adults and one child. There was no cash assistance either. Yes, Ashley had given birth with Medicaid, very important. Uh, they had this housing subsidy, which Ashley would subsequently lose due to non-payment of, of the minimal rent the housing authority did charge. Uh, but, but uh, you know, it hit me. You never know when you're going to have an epiphany. And this was really an epiphany. I wondered, um, I'd been studying welfare in the early 1990s, but I'd gone off and studied other topics. And I wondered if it was possible that in the aftermath of welfare reform, which is now 20 years old, a new kind of poverty had arisen in the United States, a poverty so deep we hadn't even thought to look for it. So I literally tucked this insight into my back pocket and went on with my work on the transition to adulthood and didn't really actually think about it again until the fall uh, when uh, Lou Schaefer showed up at my door at Harvard, 8 a.m. in the morning on Wednesday. Uh, he had come as a visiting professor. I had agreed to sponsor him in a weak moment, and I'd forgotten. So here he is, first day of work. I'm scrambling to remember who he was. Uh, but the first thing I thought of, the first thing that occurred to me is, is he was an expert on the one U.S. data set the one U.S. data source uh, from the Census Bureau that could answer better than any other whether what I had observed with Ashley was just a thing and, and of one, a blip, or a trend. So I hurriedly told him Ashley's story, and uh, he said, well, I can, I can tell you uh, within a few days, you know, whether this is a, a blip or a trend. And when he came back to my office a few days later, we were stunned, absolutely stunned, uh, to see that according to the best data we have available, uh, the number of families with children living virtually cashless lives like Ashley had roughly doubled. Since then, we've done analyses on every extent data set you can possibly find in the United States, including administrative data from the food stamp program. And over and over again, we see a dramatic rise uh, in many data sets, a more dramatic rise uh, than we saw with that original data set in extreme poverty, virtually cashless uh, poverty. Absolutely stunning. But you know, in many ways, the numbers raised more questions than they answered. So you may be asking yourself right now, you know, how do people get into this state? Uh, what are, how do they survive? Because of course you can't actually live on just $2 a day. We all know that, right? Uh, and what are the consequences? What are the long-term consequences in particular for children? 
living in two exposed to two dollar a day poverty. So just to give you a sense of the magnitude, uh, in, uh, in 2013, if you follow kids in the United States over the course of a year, about 3.4 million children experience at least three months living below two dollars per person per day. 3.4 million children in the world's most advanced capitalist society in, our, in the richest uh, nation on earth. So uh, after we'd sort of delved into the numbers, we decided we needed to go back and find more uh, families like Ashley's. And we actually set ourselves uh, a challenge. Uh, so we were, you know, we said, gee, can we just identify four places across the United States where we, we don't live? Can we just go there and find these people? And can we follow a small group of people over many months and years and begin to develop some ideas about uh, what the answers to those questions might be? So we began in Chicago, Illinois. You might think of it as sort of a, the quintessential American city, the city of big shoulders. We'd both gone to graduate school there, so it's fun to spend time there again. Uh, we then wanted to find a place that had been a boom town um, when uh, Lyndon Johnson announced the war on poverty. But it since hit the skids. We chose a Cleveland, Ohio. Its boosters in the 50s called it the greatest location in the nation for business. Today they say something else about Cleveland. I won't repeat it here because I love Cleveland now, having spent three summers there. We then wanted to find a place that during Linda Johnson's time had really been one of the poorest places in America, but it had seen somewhat of a revival. So we chose a section of Appalachia around Johnson City, Tennessee, uh, that had been a, a one of America's poorest places, but it was now at the nation's average. But still with deep poverty, especially in its trailer parks uh, and more mountain communities. And then finally, we wanted to choose a place that had been deeply poor in Johnson's time and was still one of the poorest places in the nation. So we chose two hamlets uh, in, in the Mississippi Delta, uh, one of which we fictitiously named Percy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Percy tonight. And, and our visit to Percy, I will tell you, sh uh, uh, shook me up. Even as a veteran 25-year poverty researcher, I'd never experienced anything uh, like, like Percy. And so the story of $2 a day, as you know, is really a story of uh, causes, survival strategies, and potential consequences. And as you remember, we tell a, sort of a three-legged stool story about the causes of the rise in $2 a day poverty. Uh, first, of course, there is the collapse of the social safety net in America. Five million adults uh, used to be on cash assistance in the United States is now under 600,000. Half of those are in just two states, New York and California, meaning that across the whole nation, there are only 300,000 adults on cash assistance today. You would never know this, given the rhetoric that's come out about welfare reform, even very recently. Even if you do manage in the United States to get on cash assistance, in the typical state, if you're a mom with two kids and you have no income, the maximum you can claim is $420 on average. It's a little higher here in New Hampshire. But New Hampshire is pretty much the nation's story in terms of, of, of the implosion of TANF. So uh, the collapse of that safety net and how it happened is, is the subject of the book, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a subject that's very relevant today. Uh, short uh, policy lesson, say no to block rents. And I can talk more about that during the Q&A. Uh, second, though, is really uh, the affordable housing crisis. You may remember the story uh, of Ray McCormick, the, the, the ubiquity of housing challenges among the $2 a day poor, the ubiquity of homelessness and repeated perilous double-ups, and the incredible trauma uh, that children like Jennifer Hernandez's kids faced, a sexual trauma, because oftentimes mothers can't even be selective about what couch they're going to surf on on a given night. Um, since 2000, the cost of rental housing has increased by about 6%, but the wages of renters has declined by 18, by 12%, leading to an almost complete disconnect. And you see this in your own community between 
uh, rents and wages. And third, of course, and probably most importantly, is what's happened to the low-wage labor market. Uh, simply put, the bad jobs of 20 years ago were simply much, much better than the bad jobs of today. Uh, sure, teenagers could work at these jobs, but these are families. Uh, and, given, uh, and given what's happening with, with wage theft, uh, with unstable scheduling, uh, lack of guaranteed hours, uh, frequent layoffs, families are just desperate and struggling to survive. So in the book, we talk about, uh, of course, Ray McCormick and her heroic uh, win of being named $2 uh, cashier of the month twice in her first six months of employment, but then getting fired on a flute when she doesn't have the gas uh, to get to work one day. And we also talk about uh, Jennifer Hernandez, who has the most horrific job I've ever heard of, uh, cleaning abandoned buildings on the south side of Chicago with power and heat in the middle of the Chicago winter and, and uh, what happened to her family as a result. So that's sort of the three-legged stool story. Uh, the survival strategies are myriad, uh, but I wanted to uh, read a section of the book about one of them. This section of $2 a day has been more impactful for our readership than, than any other. Yet, it is the most remunerative and one of the only fully legal strategies our subjects employ, that is selling plasma. I'm going to read to you from, from the book about uh, Jessica. You probably remember Jessica and Travis and their two little girls, Rachel and Blythe. And then I'm going to talk about the plasma industry in the United States and how it is literally being built on the backs of the extreme poor. So this is from chapter four. There is no money made to be selling blood anymore, but you can sell plasma, a component in blood that is used in a number of treatments for serious illness. Selling plasma is so common among the $2 a day poor that it might be thought of as a lifeblood. It is legal to donate up to two times a week, for which a plasma bank will pay you around $30 a time, $60 total. In Johnson City, Tennessee, 21-year-old Jessica Compton donates plasma as often as 10 times a month, as frequently as the law allows. Plasma Biological Services, the local donation center, is located in a one-story white building fronted with plate glass, with the business name spelled out in large red letters. Jessica is able to donate only when her husband, Travis, has time to keep an eye on their two daughters, Rachel and Blythe. He can do that pretty frequently these days because he's been out of work since the beginning of December when McDonald's reduced his hours to zero in response to slow foot traffic. It's nearly February now. Upon arriving at Plasma Biological Services, Jessica checks in. A regular donor, she can bypass the initial time-consuming full-on health screening. Instead, she proceeds to a kiosk, rhythmically clicking the mouse to answer the required questions about her health. Quote, when you get there, they have you fill out 22 questions. They ask you about your health, and like if you've had recent tattoos, or been in jail, or had any piercings lately. Yeah, even if you get a tattoo or something, you've got to tell them. Then you've got to wait like six months, and then they let you come back. Travis has had too many tattoos and doesn't remember the exact times and places he acquired all of them. Details that the plasma center requires. He said he has been told he, quote, need not come by to donate. After completing these initial steps, Jessica sits in the waiting room listen for, listening for her name to be called. Then, quote, they take your blood pressure and your temp. And then if everything is okay, you wait and get your finger pricked and test for your iron and your protein and stuff. Usually, it'd be during my time of the month that my iron really goes down. Lately, the iron pills Jessica's tried haven't been working. This terrifies her because, quote, donating is the cash bedrock of the family's finances right now. The phlebotomist in charge of finger pricking has told her that, quote, if the iron pills don't help, it means I could be like anemic. Anemics are barred from donating. Today, like other days, she's nervous. What will happen if she's not allowed to give plasma? The family desperately needs the $30. They're now nearly three months behind on the rent. 
Travis often stands at the kitchen window of their cramped one-bedroom apartment as if transfixed on the lookout for the sheriff who might show up any time to evict them. Jessica says, usually they tell me to wait because my blood pressure is always up, so I have to wait. They make you wait an extra 10 minutes just to see if it goes down. After failing the test the first time, Jessica sits, taking deep, calming breaths before getting retested. When asked why her blood pressure nearly always registers as too high initially, she says, I don't know, it must be just stress, being nervous about iron levels or something. Once Jessica passes all the tests, she proceeds to the back room where she's directed to a recliner. Quote, it's like a big open space with a lot of chairs in there, like machines and stuff. You go back there, and that's where they just hook you up. Today she's brought along a Nicholas Sparks novel she checked out of the library. Quote, I always bring a book with me. A technician feels around for her vein with a plastic-gloved finger. Once the vein is located, the technician squeezes out some iodine with a Q-tip and begins spreading the thick liquid in a small circle, slowly widening the circle and rubbing the spot for about 30 seconds, staining Jessica's forearm brown. She positions, positions the IV, snaking it around Jessica's wrist and over the inner part of her forearm. The needle, banded in green with two small flap-like wings, is inserted into the vein. Quote, I can't ever look at it. I never look at it when they do it. They do it right here, she says, pointing to the obvious indentation in the crease in her arm, which looks somewhat like a drug track line. Many among the $2 a day poor bear these small scars from repeated plasma donations. She then contracts her fist to start the blood floating, keeps contracting it at intervals to keep the purplish liquid moving down the tube to the machine that will separate her blood from her plasma. The goldish liquid is extracted and preserved while her blood and platelets are returned to her system. First an extraction, then a return, another extraction, and then so on. What is happening, you, quote, just got to sit there as the tube flows yellow, then red, back and forth. For the usual person, it takes about 45 minutes, but for Jessica, it takes well over an hour. She is just over the minimum weight of 110 pounds. The procedure takes a toll, she says. Quote, I get tired, especially if my iron's down. I get, like, really tired. She describes the rest of the process as follows. Quote, then you get up to the front, and you get your slip of paper, and they put your money in a card. Then you just go home. It's like a debit card. It's prepaid. The ritual takes roughly three hours door-to-door. Even so, the payoff is good, relatively speaking, $10 an hour. As long as her iron, blood pressure, and temperature are okay, she'll donate as often as she's legally allowed. But no one could reasonably think of twice-a-week plasma donation as a job. It's a survival strategy, one of many operating well outside the low-wage labor market. So since writing that passage, we have geocoded every plasma center in the United States. We did this in part because uh, several big pharma companies contacted us after the book came out, concerned about how we had characterized plasma donations, pointing out that it was a vital, uh, that it was behind vital uh, life-saving uh, therapies. So, uh, by the way, plasma is behind several vital life-saving therapies. So I've done my job. Uh, but if you look at where those plasma uh, clinics are located, and by the way, plasma donations since uh, 2000 have risen from about uh, 5 million to 32 billion independent donors. They tend to be one of the best predictors of where they are located is not where the poor live, but where the extreme poor are most likely to be located. So just one uh, vignette uh, from the survival strategies part of our research. Now when I talked to the students, I ended by talking about finding your voice. Uh, When uh, you write a book like this, you've got to decide how to write it, how to tell the story. And I don't think I had settled that question in my own mind until I met Tabitha in the Mississippi Delta. Another strategy that's almost ubiquitous among the extreme poor, besides selling plasma, is selling your food stamps. Uh, We know this is not very common among the just plain poor, about 1.3%. But among the extreme poor, how are you going to buy your kids socks and underwear? What about the backpack for school? What about the utilities so you can have heat and light? 
This is how Alva Mae Hicks in the Mississippi Delta, mother of 14, many Southern families are still very large, uh, as a sort of a leftover from the agricultural economy. Uh, this is literally the only source of income she had uh, coming into the household. And she used uh, the food stamps, uh, three, $600 of her food stamp allotment, to pay a roughly $300 utility bill in a climate that ranged just in a six-month span from 9 uh, to 109. So, of course, if you know anything about SNAP, and some of you do, our food stamp program, it only allows for $1.40 per meal per person. And studies show that in most families it runs out, right, two to three weeks into the month. But for Alva May, having expended $600 of her allotment to pay her utility bill, she ran out after a week. And Tabitha, her daughter, and her siblings were the hungriest kids I can never remember meeting so hungry. And indeed, they'd been this way since Tabitha's father abandoned the family when she was in the fourth grade. So as I got to know Tabitha and her siblings, she shared uh, the following story with me. You know, hunger just pervaded her narrative. And she, re you know, <laughs> in this three-bedroom, two-bedroom apartment, right, there were uh, eight kids on one bed all laid out like logs under a blanket, and, and, and the rest of the kids slept uh, on the floor in the living room. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when a sibling began crying from hunger, you could hear it, and it just haunted your dreams. And, and she would often talk about, about how especially her little brothers would just break her heart with their, with their cries of hunger. There's one little vignette in the book I can't resist, including... When the stepfather, who's uh, of the mother's boyfriend, who's quite a wicked character, comes in to the house with bags of McDonald's, and these little boys light up. And he goes into the back room, closes the door, and eats it all himself. So, can't make this stuff up. But in any case, um, she's in ninth grade, and great student, good kid. And uh, a gym teacher inboxes her on Facebook. And he writes, uh, I've been watching you since you were young, waiting for you to mature. He then offers her food if she'll come to his house after school and have sex with him. And she ends up in this situation for five months before finally, desperate, she tells another teacher who not only gets her out of the situation, but sort of airlifts her miraculously to a boarding school in Memphis, where she graduates and goes on to college. And kind of an amazing story, but uh, another story she tells is about how the family is struggling so much with hunger, uh, her older brother uh, goes and visits a friend who lives in, in, um, along the bluffs uh, in Arkansas, and he goes cliff diving uh, with his friends. He's wearing a white shirt. And somebody is, is videotaping, uh, you know, is, is capturing, uh, I guess you don't call it videotaping anymore, is capturing, vide videoing uh, this cliff dive. And uh, her brother goes to an unsafe part of the cliff and dives. And what gets posted on YouTube is just the white shirt floating down, down the river. He dies, and, and Tabitha's commit, convinced he, he commits suicide. We don't know this for, for sure, but her version of the story is he committed suicide to escape the hunger. So she's just told us the story. We're sitting at a little cafe in Clarksdale, Mississippi, about 30 miles from her house, called Yazoo Pass. It's actually the old Woolworths where the Freedom Riders came. It's now a kind of a swanky cafe. And we're sitting outside. It's, it, you know, the sun is setting, hotter than hell. There are two fans sort of worrying, keeping us cool. And, and I finally say to her, Tabitha, what does it feel like to be hungry, that hungry? And she says, it feels like you want to be dead because it's peaceful being dead. 
So after I heard that narrative, I decided that the only way to tell these stories is through the voices of the folks that we had spent these many months and years. You know, I, I could read you chapter and verse on all of the statistical analysis we've done behind the study. I have thousands of academic references, but in the end, it was Tabitha's story that got told in her own words and on her own terms. And so that was the voice of this book, uh, somewhat different than my other books, although they're fun and fantastic as well. At least I like to think so. Uh, I just want to end uh, with a coda. Uh, this work, some people say to me, how do you do this work? And what they don't know is how incredibly rewarding it is. It's, it's, a, it's the best job in America. Um, but the rewards come in really unexpected places. So when $2 a day was published, everyone we could still find got a visit from us, and we went and sat with them and read them the text of what we had written about them. And I was most nervous about Tabitha. Uh, actually, it was her teacher, the one who rescued her to the Mississippi boarding school, who was the one to go to her dorm uh, at college and, and read her this narrative. I think we were all holding our breath. There's the abusive boyfriend. Uh, there's pr prostitution in the small town. Uh, there's the suicide story. There's the sex for food. And we thought, she's going to regret talking to us. You know, she's going to say, how could you have done this to me? Uh, so I remember uh, her teacher calling us immediately after this event. And, and I said, what happened? And he said, well, she cried. And I said, well, what did she say? Uh, and, and this is what he told me that she said. It's like a dream come true. I never thought my suffering would mean something. Now it does. So thank you, and I, I welcome your questions. I know sometimes you have to sit with the stories for a minute before you can raise your hand, so I appreciate what's, what's going on in the room right now. Yes? There was a great deal of poverty during the depression. Um, how would you, how do you see the difference between that and what we see now? Yeah, so, I mean, we don't have a lot of good ethnographic accounts of the depression, but it was something that everybody was in together. So. What I have read about the Depression is it didn't have this moral valence, you know, this sense that you were on the outside of society, that you were uh, a, sort of a reject. And that was very palatable in our interviews. So not only were people suffering from poverty, but from social isolation, social separation, but most compellingly, shame. So. You know, it's interesting, my public health colleagues, I just came from Johns Hopkins uh, to Princeton and, and uh, premier public health school in the world. My colleagues are all over the world, and I gave a talk similar to this when I got to the School of Public Health a couple years ago. And I thought, gosh, this is not going to go over well, because what they're experiencing must be so much worse than what I'm seeing. And to a person, they said, Oh, poverty in America is so much worse. And I'm thinking, this is not objectively true. Right? We don't have, out, we do have some ringworm again now in the United States, but we don't have, you know, cholera and, and all of these unbelievable conditions. But of course, what they meant is the sense of social exclusion and isolation. And, and you know, what was interesting about Percy is it's sitting in the middle of some of the richest agricultural soil in the world. And right on the edge of Percy are cornfields. You know, I grew up in Minnesota, knee high by the 4th of July, right? By the 4th of July, this corn was 10 feet high. But it wasn't meant for consumption by humans. It's production corn. So literally, you have starving people on the edge of fields with corn 10 feet high, that they can't consume. It's quite a, it's quite a uh, contradiction. So uh, I would say that it's probably, you know, relative deprivation probably, um, you know, we used to think that poverty was just about stuff, 
And I think stuff's important. It's food, shelter, and clothing, all of these things are really important. But two other aspects of poverty, I think, are probably as important. One is, do you have power and autonomy over your own life? Do you feel that you have choices? Can you say no to that gym teacher? Uh, the second is, do you feel like you're a valued member of your community? Do you feel that you're able to con contribute? And what's interesting is we ended every interview with a question, you know, describe to me what it would be like if you felt you were really making it. And, you know, they, they usually um, shared very modest dreams. Gee, if I had a $12 an hour job, 40 hours a week, I can't even imagine how good that would be. Travis wanted 14. So he was kind of an outlier. But I mean, th th this, that's $28,000 a year for a full time, full year worker. So, you know, they didn't want Shangri La. But what they wanted even more than that is they wanted a chance to contribute, a chance to belong. And, and I think that's, uh, that's something we can all get on board with. You know, having everyone in our community play a role and make a contribution. Very good question. Yeah, red sweater. Yeah, so we, we tried sort of not to give ourselves, you know, we, we thought maybe the numbers were a fluke, frankly. <laughs> so we tried not to give ourselves those advantages. In, in Chicago, when we use somewhat different strategies in each location. So uh, in Chicago, uh, we made connections with a variety of social service organizations in West and South Chicago. <laughs> Uh, and a Salvation Army in the north side. Uh, but more importantly, we hired uh, college seniors um, from uh, uh, inner city college who had graduated from Chicago high schools on the west and south side, who then canvassed the other graduates in their classes to see if there were families and individuals who, who qualified. And of course, we could only follow a couple of these of these families, but they, the, the goal was to be very heterogeneous. In, in Cleveland, we were actually conducting another uh, random household survey. And we got those, these folks, they just showed up in our sample. Uh, in the Mississippi Delta, um, uh, we, where mistrust is so deep, and someone like us just coming in cold would never have worked, uh, we, we worked with uh, a number of, of community groups, but most in, in particular, uh, this teacher who had been in the community for, for 10 years, was an outsider, uh, but had really gotten the trust of many of the families. And in Johnson City, Tennessee, uh, Eastern Tennessee State has a really good folklore program. And we hired a local folklorist who went and and uh, just did a marvelous job recruiting families, literally finding people living in their cars uh, for us. So those were the strategies we used. A little, little different in each place. And then, of course, we had to craft those relationships in each place um, with each family. Uh, but we, we uh, it was just an, a magnificent experience. Heartbreaking, but, uh, you know, so much goodwill and and open this once you crack through that initial barrier. There's a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, so um, poverty is, I'm just defining it using the US poverty line. Poverty has stayed remarkably consistent in the United States, uh, in New Hampshire, for the last couple of decades. We've seen very little progress. We, we've seen a little bit of a lift now. You know, we did see a, a worsening during the recession. We're seeing a little bit of a lift, but we're still not back uh, to pre-recession levels. But the real story about what's happened with poverty is not the mean over the last 20 years. It's in the distribution. So it used to be that the poor were the poor. We didn't really think of the poor as having distinct subgroups. But what welfare reform did is a lot of good things and a lot of bad things at the same time. So for example, if you're working but poor and you're able to work full time, full year, you've never been better off because we have these generous tax credits. Uh, they won't make you rich, but they'll get you right to the poverty line, which isn't very high. 
Uh, but other groups have seen uh, their safety net collapse, particularly people who can't manage to find full-time, full-year work. So it was a great idea uh, to sur- support the, wealth, the working poor. This was, uh, these, these changes were passed in 1993 in the early years of the Clinton years. But, um, but what we did is we, we, we attached, we kind of put all of our eggs in the basket of work. We said, if you work, we're going to help you. But if for some reason you can't, you can't work full-time, full-year, you can't find a job, you have a sick family member, um, you're taking care of a disabled child, there is no longer anything except the SNAP program, the food stamp program, to catch you if you fall. Right now, SNAP is an entitlement. Already states are eating away at that entitlement, be- beginning to require work. Uh, Most singles who don't have dependent children are now required to work. They're subject to strict time limits on food. Uh, We know from research, I'm not meaning to be an advocate here, but we know from research uh, that when kids uh, hit that last week of the month when the food stamps fall, their cognitive function suffers and their performance in school. So think about, you know, the investment in, in the next generation. And so what's happened is that the story of the poor is sort of in a flat story, but the working poor have actually gone, gotten better off. And I mean, people who only are able to work intermittently, intermittently have gotten much, much worse off. Most poor people do work intermittently. There's very few households that have no work over the course of a year. So the poor uh, are no, you know, you can't really characterize them as ha- being a dependent class. Now, you all have relatives, I know, uh, who probably, you know, defy the stereotype or prove the stereotype. But uh, what we know from national data is that the work ethic is, is deeply held. Uh, but for those who aren't able to cash in on the full-time, full-year benefits, they're really, uh, they're really in this very fragile place. So the, um, two other categories have emerged. One that the Census Bureau has embraced, it's called deep poverty. That's people living... Uh, at 50% of the poverty line, that has gone up in the, net, in, in the nation, even though the poverty rate has remained flat. It's likely to have gone up here. I wasn't able to look before coming tonight. Uh, and the rate of extreme poverty, that is uh, the $2 a day threshold, has increased uh, quite dramatically in every state. And again, I believe New Hampshire is about at the mean in the story of what's happened uh, to the safety net. Uh, Vermont, your neighbor, is an outlier in the, in the positive direction. Uh, but most of the other New England states are at the mean. Way back. Hi, my name is Sue, and I work on a local backpack program, uh, delivering the main um, Yeah, so this is sort of n- new news. Yes, so she's really interested in the subgroups and how hard it is to sort of both measure locally but also communicate the plight of the subgroups uh, because this, this this is kind of an invisible problem. You know, there, there are a number of books. We can help you with that first, so write to us. Uh, but second, there are a number of books coming out now sort of dealing with the increasing uh, social isolation of the rich and the poor in the America. So Bob Putnam's book, Our Kids, uh, Richard Reeves, Opportunity Hoarders, uh, even Charles Murray's Coming Apart, all tell the story of increasing separation. And we see it in the data in residential segregation by income. We are more segregated in America than we've ever been in our entire history by income. So this is a big problem. Uh, I think one thing we can do is to begin to think creatively about ways to knit our communities back together. You know, I grew up in a small rural community, small rural church where the welfare recipients and and the director of the technical institute is my dad, worship together. And increasingly that's not happening, right? Churches are becoming more segregated as well. So uh, in some ways, we need more middle ground solutions where citizens are coming together across economic lines uh, to know each other in ways that are, are deep and, and meaningful. So suddenly, uh, it's not, it's not the, the crazy relative you know, that everyone talks about at Christmas, but it's, 
it's your child's best friend's parents who are experiencing the problem. Uh, I, I commiserate with you. Uh, it's, it's very tough. Uh, but I, I kind of think that uh, there's magic in marrying stories and numbers. And the message of $2 a day has, been, uh, has really captured people. And if we didn't have the numbers, the stories would be anecdotes. Uh, but if we didn't have the stories, the numbers wouldn't register. So um, I know there's probably a local affiliate to the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities here in your region. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, spoken, I've spoken with that group. But we can probably help you out at, at least to some degree with data. Yeah. Is there any politician in water yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had in-depth conversations with lots of folks in Washington uh, over the last couple of years. I'd say our big advocate is uh, Sherrod Brown. We've had really great reception from Rosa Delario, who's a uh, representative from Connecticut, Elijah Cummings uh, in Baltimore, Gwen Moore, oh, how wonderful, in Milwaukee. Uh, Gwen Moore actually interviewed me for Book TV, read the book cover to cover, had great questions. Um, we even had some, uh, you know, sympathy uh, on these issues from Mike Lee, who helped put, push forward uh, the, the expanded ta tax, child tax credit, and that was a that was an idea originally championed by Sherrod Brown, but carefully orchestrated in Washington to to get through without a without partisan opposition. Uh, so there, there's uh, Ron Wyden uh, in Oregon is a big supporter. Cory Booker, if you catch him on the right day, he's he's amazing. Uh, he's a busy guy, but we've really, uh, you know, uh, Senator um, Senator uh, Brown bought a copy of the book uh, for every member of the Democratic Caucus, and uh, and uh, threatened the staffers that he was going to test them. So we've had just tons of interaction with all those folks. They are not in Washington right now, but they are in positions of influence, working. And, uh, you know, there's still, there are many wonderful civil servants still in Washington uh, listening to evidence uh, that, we're, that we're in touch with as well. So, yeah, they're out there. All the way back. If you read $2 a day, and we're not mental health professionals, and actually I think the one criticism of the book that's, the book hasn't gotten a lot of criticism, but one criticism has been that we probably didn't talk about that much. We do talk about adverse childhood experiences, but not mental health directly. Uh, but you can smell it and taste it in the stories. And, you know, it's hard to know whether it's pre-existing or whether it's really brought on by the struggle. But I can tell you the mental and physical health challenges over time mount exponentially. You know, we're still following some of these families, and it's like, you know, you, you, I think that's the big concern about two-hourly poverty. Can you let people fall so low that they can no longer be economically mobile, or they can no longer respond to economic opportunity? And, and I think if you think of the stories of Jennifer Hernandez and Ray McCormick in particular, uh, who've had such a long stint of two-dollar-a-day poverty, uh, you began to wonder if, if it's a disabling, literally a disabling condition. Uh, we're doing further work on that with the School of Public Health um, and some docs from uh, JHU Medical School. So we're working uh, to try to understand that. But I think it's an excellent question and probably uh, a just critique of our work that we didn't talk about it more. Yes. So I remember uh, when I was at the Kennedy School, I was at the Kennedy School at Harvard for many years, and George Borjas was my, my colleague, and of course he, he would argue that immigration is killing American jobs, and Doug Massey, my, my chair when I got tenure, arguing the opposite, and these wars are just, you know, fierce, and, and different evidence is, is presented to, to, um, to prop up each side, and ultimately, I don't think we're going to be making the decision on, on evidence, uh, sadly. But uh, I was more convinced by Massey than Borjas, but you know, you should read the evidence and, and decide for yourself. Uh, we left out immigrants from this story because immigrants 
had the conditions that our families are facing now prior to welfare reform because they were not eligible for benefits. So they didn't experience necessarily worsening conditions because of a policy change, and that was our theme. But you can just imagine that the stories we're telling have been the stories of immigrants all along. You know, it, it is amazing, uh, uh, all of the upward mobility uh, that you see even in the face of, of these tremendous challenges. So, uh, point well taken. Uh, right here. You know, we don't know. Uh, there, there really are, as far as I know, no data sources that both gather good enough income data and good enough epidemiological data. Now, there are a lot of really clever economists out there that are smarter than me who might think of a way to do this on a population level. Uh, we have found, uh, it, it's a good idea, actually. <laughs> uh, um, but we have found that for every decrease uh, in uh, of 100 TANF cases within a state, Schools report an additional 14.4 homeless children. So in many states, there have been thousands and thousands of caseload reductions. And we are now able to directly link that to child homelessness. So, I mean, I think finding that kind of evidence is really important. You know, we need to be able to find the health impacts, because it's the easiest way to put a price on the, on the problem. So that's, that's exactly the way we ought to go. Uh, child health in general is improving, probably because you know, we've added uh, the child health insurance program. We've expanded Medicaid. Uh, George Bush, too, made food stamps more generous, mostly to help the working poor. Um, so we've done some good things for children, but again, our hypothesis is at the very end of the tale for these really extreme poor children, there's a different story to be told, and we're increasingly finding, uh, if you look just descriptively and you divide the poor into these four categories, we are finding that on many indicators, there's just a different story for those kids at the very bottom. Uh, again, we haven't looked at suicide in particular, probably because it's pretty rare, and so it's hard to see it in a lot of, a lot of data sets. But it's a really good idea. Yes? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, it did used to be um, that family sizes were relatively large, the families of the poor, five kids on average. Uh, that number is down to about 2.1, 2.2. So the average middle class person is about 1.9. You do in the Deep South see some very large families, again, you know, those kind of tradition. Um, I won't say that family structure is not important. I spent all those years I spent away from welfare. Uh, I was studying family structure and, and the impact of that on kids. So um, my book promises I could keep with me Kafalis and doing the best I can about the dads with my co-author over here, Timothy Nelson. Uh, I think are great, are great reads and really hit that question head on. It's a question that I began asking because callers, uh, when I did a lot of radio and TV talk shows, uh, would always ask. And I thought, that's, you know, that's, academics are not asking that question. It's a really good one. So I have spent a considerable part of my career really delving into that. And family structure is a part of this story, but it's not necessarily super early births or too many births. Oftentimes it's a very high rate of family instability and complexity that characterizes uh, low-income kids' lives. So lots of uh, casting, uh, changing cast of characters of parental figures very early in life. Good issue. Yes? Yes, yeah, so this is a great thing to advocate on. And again, this I'm not an advocate, I'm an academic, so I'm not being political about this, is, but uh, okay, good for you. So uh, you know the number of TANF recipients, as I said, is is just fallen through the floor. We in most states we have no functioning TANF system left. Uh, 
In many ways, the reason for that is in 1996, we ended the, enti the legal entitlement for aid. Back in the day, if you could prove you were needy, you had a legal right to whatever your state was offering. It might not have been much in Mississippi. It was a lot better in Vermont, but you had a legal right. We ended that, and we said to states, we're going to keep sending the same $16.5 billion we've been sending to you all along. You need to sort of spend it, you know, within a set of core purposes, although we're not going to look. Uh, but you can be innovative. And you no longer have to help someone just because they demonstrate need. So things worked out pretty well uh, in the late 1990s. The economy was very strong. States, states weren't experiencing a lot of budget shortfalls. Uh, but then came 2000. A lot of states were really hit hard. Governors wanted to do things they couldn't afford to do. And TANF became a slush fund. So in uh, Michigan, the governor decided uh, he wanted to offer college scholarships to kids who stayed in, in state and went to school. So suddenly kids whose parents were earning $1,000 were essentially taking TANF dollars to go to college. In Louisiana, it was crisis pregnancy centers. In Oklahoma, it was um, to shore up the child welfare uh, system after a crisis exposed the flaws in that system. And you know the governor didn't want to raise taxes in order to pay. So of that $16.5 billion now, less than $5 billion goes for direct assistance. And the rest is diverted. Okay, that's problem one, right? You create almost impossible perverse incentives for states. What are you going to do if you have this opportunity, this flexible funding stream? And by the way, welfare recipients have no political constituency. No one is even going to notice if you hurt them. That's never going to hurt you in an election. It's going to make you look good because you were tough on welfare, right? And once you give that money away and a recession comes, as happened, you can't get it back. And that's probably why in 2008, 2009, the TANF rules hardly budged at all. Completely unresponsive to recessions. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that when states get block grants, they're usually not indexed to inflation. So the value of the TANF block grant has decreased by a third over the last 20 years. And that's in an era of relatively low inflation. So what you're going to see is these programs will disappear. But no one will notice. It'll be a slow death, right? It'll be a slow death, uh, both to the funding stream, uh, and and uh, and states will will end up responding uh, to uh, to incentives to divert if if they're allowed to. And it's really hard to monitor states. There's been virtually no monitoring with TANF. States have done all kinds of crazy things with the money. They've done some good things, too. They've expanded child care systems, for example. Uh, but that goes to the working poor. So again, we're shifting the safety net toward those full-time, full-year workers at the expense of folks who don't have that available to them. And uh, more power to you. Thank you all so much.